So today my guest is Evan Brand. Evan, for those who don't know, is a podcast host, functional medicine practitioner and nutritional therapist. He's passionate about healing chronic fatigue, obesity and depression epidemics after solving his own IBS and depression issues. He uses at-home lab testing and customized supplement protocols to find and fix the root causes of a wide range of health symptoms. His podcast, Evan Brand, the Evan Brand Podcast, has over 7 million downloads and counting. He's the author of Stress Solutions, REM Rehab, and the Everything Guide to Nootropic. So Evan, welcome. And hey, for Vivian. those who don't know your story, how you got into the health world, I feel like it's very similar to my story, so I would love for you to give us an overview. Sure. Yeah. Well, the story is still continuing, right? His story is never over, uh, but it started out with gut issues first. And uh, I actually just recorded a podcast today all about the conventional medicine world and how they approach gut health versus the functional medicine world. And it's totally different. It's just uh, usually a couple of doctors that'll prescribe a couple of drugs and send you on your way. And that's a story that many people have had, whether they're in the US or Australia or the UK. I mean, it's, it's no different in any developed country. Maybe you get lucky and they run a stool test on you, but in most cases, they don't even do that. So I didn't have any conversation about diet when I was suffering. I got an idiopathic diagnosis of IBS, and that just means they don't know what's going on, but they have to label it something. So they'll label it IBS, and then that legally gives them the right to prescribe a drug. So generally, they'll prescribe like an acid blocker. They'll prescribe maybe an antispasmatic drug. Uh, sometimes an antidepressant because there is some role of gut motility in serotonin. So sometimes uh, GI doctors will prescribe SSRIs to try to see if they can help. But I denied all of it because I knew, even though I didn't know what I know now, I knew back then that it wasn't a deficiency of drugs. Like, okay, something's going on. The drug is not the answer. I don't know what the cause is, but I'm going to keep searching. So eventually I found out I had parasites I had H. pylori, I had bacterial overgrowth problems, I had candida problems, and it took me several years to treat it all, but eventually using herbs, we were able to get all the infections gone, retest it to confirm everything was gone, and then my health got way better. And then I got exposed to mold, and then that took me way down the rabbit hole again of various health symptoms, and then I'm slowly recovering from that. And I had various tick bites and co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella, that's a whole other can of worms. So I've been through it all, which gives me a lot of sympathy and empathy for the people I work with clinically. I've worked with over a thousand people now around the world clinically uh, doing consults and looking into these root causes, people that were basically shut out or gave up from the conventional medical world where doctors say, I don't know what else to do. Those are the people that come to me. And so sometimes we'll get people that luckily haven't had a bad you know, interaction with the conventional world, but most of the time they've been to five, 10, 15, 20 practitioners, and then they come to me and luckily we're able to resolve the issues. And I don't say that to boost my ego or toot my horn. I just say that because I suffered so much on my own and I'm very detailed about finding the missing pieces. So if, for example, you go all in on candida, but you have parasites or H. pylori, you're not gonna win. If you go all in on Lyme, but you've got something else going on, you're not gonna win. And that's where a lot of practitioners and the internet go wrong. And that was kind of my situation as I was going to specialist and they zoom in too much. So they'll blame everything on this one issue. But in reality, people have permission to have issues in all sorts of different body systems. You could have an adrenal component, a sleep component, a stress, an emotional trauma component. And that's where uh, most people just, they give up because it's too overwhelming to maintain and manage all those pieces. But uh, if you want to get better, that's sometimes what it takes. That's what I always say. I always say I specialize in hormones. So women with fertility issues and PCOS, but I learned my lesson not to narrow in too much and have the blinkers on and forget about all of these other things because for my own health I was trying to treat my hormones like year after year and I'd get some success but it wasn't until I addressed the mold issue that I could actually fully heal and I'm sure you have clients who come in to see you or virtually obviously but you start to talk about gut health and recommend stool testing. And they're like, why do you want to do that? Because I don't have any digestive issues. So are there any other symptoms or conditions that would make you suspect gut health and want to investigate that further? Any, any type of mood issue, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, dark circles under the eyes, bad breath, 
white tongue, sugar cravings. Skin manifestations can happen on the face. It can happen on the body, toenail fungus, vertical ridges on the nails, floating stool, uh, just low energy, just fatigue in general could clue us in that we need to look into the gut. So yeah, I've had many people who say, I feel fine. And I say, well, I understand that your gut feels fine, but kind of standard workup based on your symptoms, I think we should still look into the gut. So we'll run an advanced stool test that conventional GI doctors do not run. And guess what? We'll find infections eight times out of 10. And then once we come up with the appropriate herbs to address those bugs, people feel better. Their energy comes back online. And they'll say, you know what? Now that you you know, made my gut work better, I actually realized that my gut wasn't functioning the way it should have been. I thought that was normal for your poop to do this or that. And now I realize it wasn't. And now I am way better. So that's the thing too, is that people, they get so used to being miserable and symptomatic, they forget what true normal is, right? So they kind of adjust their lifestyle. I mean, for me, when I had IBS and I was in college, I remember first thing I had to do was figure out where the bathroom was because I thought it was normal to have to run and go poop. And that's obviously not normal to have to do that urgently, but that was my normal, right? So that's why you have to do a good workup on people, even though they may underreport symptoms, especially men. Women are more tuned into their bodies, but men, you know, they're somewhat numb. They don't pay much attention. And in some cases, I'm extra sensitive and observant but a lot of men are not and so they skip stuff or they ignore stuff i sometimes find those who are resistant to test their gut or don't really have any digestive symptoms actually have some of the worst stool tests that i've seen sometimes their problem is acne or skin rashes or autoimmune and maybe they don't have bloating and their gut might be perfect and this can happen with celiac disease as well can't it where the intestines are like ruined and inflamed but they don't have any digestive symptoms or they don't think that they do. I've seen quite a few women who had major, major gut inflammation, but yet they said their guts felt fine and they weren't diagnosed Crohn's or celiac or ulcerative colitis or anything. But when we looked at their inflammation levels, they were not much lower than where these autoimmune clients were. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty weird to see that. And it's like, are you sure? You sure you feel fine? Because and when we look at this level, it's called calprotectin. It's a marker for inflammation in the gut. We measure that on the stool. If we look at that and we see it high, high would be like above 500 would be very high. We get concerned. And I often just probe these people. Are you sure? There's no blood in the stool. There's, you know, there's, there's no burning. There's nothing. It's just hard to believe some of these people are that inflamed, but they say they feel fine. And some people just aren't connected to their body or their symptoms. They've ignored things for so long that they just become so separate from what's going on in their body. I think so. I think so. And then maybe if they do meditation or something, they'll kind of check in with themselves and say, oh, you know what? Actually, I do have these symptoms, but they're just too busy. They're too stressed. They're busy with their job, their career, their kids. And so they kind of just shove the stuff under the rug. Maybe that's even unconsciously. They're unconsciously mm -hmm. just ignoring it. Could you talk about the difference between the type of stool test you and I think I run uh, the similar one. Is it the GI map? That you tend mm -hmm. to go for yeah what's the it's difference one of my favorites. between that and a regular stool test from the doctors well a couple different technologies so like a standard gi doc they're going to typically run what's called an antigen based test and antigen testing it can still find infections don't get me wrong it's not completely useless but it does have a pretty bad track record of finding certain things like h pylori and parasites where someone has them but the test says negative so then the doctor just says well test came back fine I don't know what's wrong with you. It's in your head, I guess, versus the DNA PCR stool testing, much, much more uh, specific and sensitive to these infections. So let's just use an analogy. If the conventional stool test, we're looking for an infection, let's just make something up and say that the, the infection would have to be as big as an orange to find it versus with the new technology, the, it could be as small as a pumpkin seed. And, and you can find it. So just in terms of specificity, in terms of how sensitive these panels are, you can find infections at a much, much lower level. And it's DNA based. So uh, sometimes the immune system doesn't respond to the infection. Therefore, the other type of test just may not flag it. If you're looking for some type of a candida antibody, for example, that's also commonly used in the conventional world. You may not have antibodies. Your immune system may not be able to fight off what you have. So that type of testing doesn't work either versus when we're using like organic acids testing, we're gonna look at the urine, 
we're going to measure the gases. It's sort of like when you take your car in for emissions testing to measure how much pollution's coming out of the tailpipe. You can do the same thing with the urine. And that way you can confirm, yes, you have this elevated arabinose, which is the gas candida produces. Therefore, we know you have candida. Or if we see elevated hyperic acid, we know, hey, they've got a bacterial overgrowth versus a conventional test may have said everything was normal. So what are some of the, so you've mentioned a couple of them, like bacterial overgrowths and also um, candida. What are the most common infections that you see? And with this being the Hormones in Harmony podcast, how do these infections and poor gut health affect hormones? Sure. Well, they all affect hormones mainly by malabsorption and creating inflammation. So when you have, let's say, major candida overgrowth, it's going to produce a toxin called acetaldehyde. Candida is a yeast that can become opportunistic where it takes over and that can be linked to anxiety, brain fog, fatigue, sugar cravings, white tongue, toenail fungus, if it gets worse. And it can affect the hormones based on the toxins it's producing, but also whether it's candida, bacterial overgrowth like Prevotella, Pseudomonas. We see a lot of Clostridia, C. difficile, something common that people pick up in hospitals and the antibiotics don't work for it anymore. So I work with a lot of resistant infections like that using herbs. Uh, we'll see a lot of blasto, which is a parasite. We'll see a lot of giardia, cryptosporidium. Those are parasites as well that come from water. So lakes, rivers, creeks, streams, people pick them up there on a camping trip and end up with diarrhea and weight loss or weight gain. Uh, H. pylori is a common bacteria that we see. It damages the parietal cells. Those are the cells that make stomach acid. So when we're talking hormones, if you don't have enough stomach acid to break down your proteins, like a good grass-fed steak, and convert that into raw nutrients to feed and fuel the hormone cycle, then things go haywire. So a lot of gut issues are connected or directly tied into the hormone issues. And I would argue you can't fix one without fixing the other. So super important. It's like a constant stress as well on the system, isn't it? And the female body in particular is like super sensitive to any signals of stress. Yeah. And, and one other thing we look at too a lot with women and hormones and PMS and things like that is we look into a marker called beta glucuronidase on the stool test we use at the bottom. There's a section there. And glucuronidation is a pathway in the body where it will take toxins, turn them into less toxic materials, and then flush those out of the body. That's also a pathway where hormones can help get shuttled out of the body, conjugated, meaning kind of wrapped up in a straitjacket, making them uh, inactive, and then dragging them out, usually through the stool. But when you have bacterial overgrowth, this enzyme malfunctions, and that'll cause the recirculation of hormones. And this alone will cause people to go crazy, especially if they're on birth control or some other type of hormones. You're just going to recirculate not only your excess hormones from the environment where you've been exposed to xenoestrogens like synthetic plastics and things like that, but also if you're taking exogenous hormones, it really throws a wrench in the gears. So we, all, we always have to look at that marker too. Do you have an order of priority in, in as to which gut infections you treat first? So you were saying before, if you've got sebum, and candida or vice versa, you have to kind of address them both, but are there any ones that you always start with? It's tough to say. It kind of depends on the person's symptoms and it depends on what's the biggest symptom. So for example, if somebody shows up with Giardia and they're losing a ton of weight, like I did, where I was getting very, very malnourished. Yeah. We're going to all hands on deck to try to get rid of the Giardia. If we have someone that has stomach ulcers and they test positive with H. pylori, we're going to be going after H. pylori. So it kind of depends on what you're up against. But in general, a lot of the herbs we use are broad spectrum, which is cool because the same herbs that can kill parasites can also kill bacteria and can, can also kill some of the fungal overgrowth. So in many cases, we're using nutrients that are going to kill kind of a broad spectrum of bad guys, and that helps people get better faster. But there are mm -hmm. certain cases where we'll kind of zoom in and focus on one specific bug. And we're all exposed to some of these things. We all have candida naturally in the system. We live in similar environments. So why is it that some people either acquire these things or they become really sick as a result? And some people are like completely healthy. Same with something like Lyme, Borrelia, um, mold. Yes, a million dollar question. And my answer to this question changes every year after I learn more and work with people more clinically. Now I believe the smoking gun based on me suffering personally and seeing it clinically, I believe mold is the big smoking gun. It's not mold that makes you sick, but it's the mycotoxins that they produce. So since mold 
you know, in general, doesn't have teeth to bite you or to bite other molds. It has to do something to stake out its territory so that it can survive and thrive. So when you're in a water damaged building, which is the majority of buildings at some point have had a water leak in a sink or under the kitchen or a washer overflowed or a bathtub drain got uh, faulty or there was a roof a roof leak because of a hailstorm. I mean, there's so many different things that can go wrong with houses. There's water pipes everywhere. So the chance of something happening with a bad seal or basement flooding and a sump pump failure or just high humidity alone can create mold growth. And the molds then produce mycotoxins, which is a way to kind of keep out competing molds. And then humans that are living or working, breathing in a water damaged building or an innocent victim or bystander, if you will, we breathe in these mycotoxins. In some cases, the molds can colonize the sinus cavity, they can colonize the gut. So now you're not only a mold reservoir, but you're a mold factory. And now you're generating mycotoxins internally. And this then weakens the immune system. So one in particular that comes from penicillin called mycophenolic acid. We see it all the time on urine testing. Mycophenolic acid is an immune suppressant. In fact, in the conventional medical world, they'll actually give patients mycophenolic acid to kill their immune system before they do an organ transplant so that you can basically shut the person's immune system down so they don't, re they don't reject the new organ. So that's how potent this toxin is. But I believe that's the big smoking gun that we've been missing, and that allows candida and these other infections to thrive. And why I say that is because what we'd see is we would give people herbs for two to three months. They would do really well. And then they'd call me back and say, you know what? The tongue is turning white again, or my brain fog's coming back, or my sugar cravings are hitting, or my fatigue levels are increasing again. What's going on? We'd retest them, and sure enough, they've got overgrowth again. But they didn't eat tons of sugar. They didn't do antibiotics. There wasn't any big cause. Now, when we look back at these people and test them for mold toxin, they show high. Once we address that using glutathione, binders, sauna, whatever we can do, whatever tools we have to address that, and get them out of the environment, then the mold levels go down, then we can use herbs and the people will get well and stay well. That's exactly what happened to me. I was doing stool tests every year and I think every time I did it, it was getting worse. I was like, what the hell is going on? I'm like the healthiest, trying to be the healthiest person that I know, spending hundreds of pounds every month on supplements, eating this really strict organic, low histamine diet. And yes, I was better than I was, but I wasn't as good as I should be. So I see that all the time as well. Um, it's tough. It's a tough journey too. And, you know, the diet tweaks can be helpful, but they're sort of band-aids. And so I've played around with low histamine as well and done DAO supplements and enzymes and different things. And those are all awesome, right? They're much, much safer than some of the conventional drugs that are going to be used for these type of bugs and issues. But man, it's it can be a long journey. And that's the thing too, is a lot of people don't have patience to fully investigate this issue because sometimes you're talking about people having to test their workplace. And if their workplace comes back moldy, what do they do? If we can't get any of the uh, mold treatment options that we have in use, then what do they do? And then air purifiers, and then you've got to have fresh air ventilation, and then you've got to put in dehumidifiers. So, you know, I'm, I'm not an environmental, uh, what they would call like an industrial hygienist. These are like people that specialize in indoor air quality. I'm not one of those, but I would argue I've, you know, become more action oriented and become more clinically helpful for people than those practitioners. They're not even practitioners, but they're just, you know, they're hygienists, basically industrial uh, air quality people, but they don't have a clue about mycotoxins. They'll do air sampling and air sampling is like you walking into the middle of the room and taking a deep breath and whatever you blow out, that's the amount of mold toxin in the room, but mold spores often fall, fall to the floor. So Although it's not perfect, what we utilize is petri dish testing, these little plates that have basically a sticky gum on them, a resin that will grab on to the falling mold and candida spores. Candida can also be in the air. It can come from you, it can come from pets, and you can breathe that in, and that can colonize your body. So candida may need to be treated in your home, not just your body, which is very important to address. And once we send the Petri dishes back to the lab, we can analyze what's going on. And sometimes there's misters, there's candles, there's fog machines, there's just different essential oil options that we use. And that can help someone's environment get well. So it's really difficult to get someone well in a sick environment. Is that the Ermi test that you do? Uh, no, the Ermi is another option. Uh, we work with a company called Immunolytics throughout of New Mexico and the States, and they do a great job. So the Petri dishes are fairly priced and they give you what's called a health score. 
So they'll test how many colonies of mold growing just based on visual. And then we'll implement one of the essential oil products that we use. And then we'll retest those Petri dishes and confirm. So I had a couch that we had purchased brand new. And every time I was sitting on this couch, I would get really fatigued. And my wife would say that my skin looked different. Like I was getting pale, like I was losing blood flow to my face for some reason. So we did a Petri dish on it and it came back probably 15. We couldn't count the, the total number of colonies that grew on the Petri dish, but it was a lot. And so then we did my fog solution. It's called Oasis fogging solution. It's basically a fog machine with an essential oil blend. We carried the couch into the master bedroom. We filled the master bedroom up with fog and we jumped up and down on the couch to try to get the fog into all the fibers. Did the same thing for the pillows and cushions. And then luckily we re retested and there was only one colony, which is a normal result. A couple of colonies could be normal and not harmful. And that's what it came out to be. So it did work. We were able to salvage our couch, but in some cases we're telling people to get new clothes, get new couches, whatever we need to do to get them better. Mm -hmm. And do you know if the test and the fogging kit is available internationally or is it just the US? Oh yeah, yeah. We ship, we ship internationally all the time. It's a little more expensive because you've got all the import duties and the European government's not very friendly with those things. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can ship stuff around the world. The Petri dishes are cheap and easy and fogging solution. It's, you know, not difficult to ship. Great. And so do you test literally everyone that comes in, you just start off with a mycotoxin test or are there any telltale signs that someone might be dealing with mold yeah good question because as i mentioned i'm working with people that have already kind of been through the ringer with practitioners and many cases even naturopaths or functional practitioners as well they've already been to those people a lot of the low-hanging fruits already been addressed so if it hasn't already been looked at we're going to look at it typically but symptoms uh, we often refer to dr richie shoemaker he's a famous mold doc we often refer to his list of symptoms we have that on our intake form so if someone comes in they'll check all these symptoms off. And if we see three or more on this list, we'll typically have people do the myco. So that could be anything from anxiety, fatigue. It could be temperature regulation issues, vertigo, dizziness. It could be histamine reactions, food intolerances, uh, difficulty with memory, word recall, major brain fog. Mm, those are a lot of them. I'm sure I could come up with more, but yeah, once we see like a handful in my of head, those, like, yep, yep, that was me. <laughs> I know it's a pain, but yeah, once we see those, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably a duck. So at that point, you know, if the person's willing and able to, we're going to try to test the urine so we can measure the body burden, but then we're also going to test the environment and see how the environment looks. What about other environmental toxins like heavy metals and EMS? How are they all connected either with gut health or mold directly or both? It's, it's a big factor. I have some clients that are EMF sensitive, so they don't have a choice. They have to do no Wi-Fi. They have to do like flip phones and they can't do smartphones, unfortunately. So, you know, there are people that are in the really sensitive side where they don't have a choice. And then there's people that are not sensitive, but we still encourage those people to reduce their RF and EMF exposure because it's a toxin. It is a pollutant. The body and humans did not evolve with the types of cell towers and, you know, they're basically portable Wi-Fi routers is what they are. If you ever measure a cell phone, like if you click on Instagram or YouTube or something like that, that streams a lot of data with video or photo, and you put an RF meter, which measures the wireless radiation out of a cell phone, my God, I mean, the levels are 20 to 50 times higher than if you're right by a cell phone tower. So people freak out about cell towers and all of that. But in reality, a cell phone, in my experience, emits far more radiation. So I try not to use my cell phone minimally at all. I, I do all my consultations on the computer, whether it's with a online phone line or Skype or FaceTime or Zoom, you know, we do all of our consults that way. One, because it's convenient for the people and I love to see the people I'm working with. But two, uh, I'm also working with a lot of international people and I don't do international calls on my cell phone. So anyway, but, and then also the radiation. I don't want to be zapping myself all the time. You have things like salivary gland tumors, which used to be extremely rare. And now uh, even famous people like LeBron James, basketball player, he developed a salivary gland tumor. And you know, every time you see the guy uh, in like a social media photo, you know, he had some kind of a headphones or Bluetooth or a cell phone on his head. So I'm not saying directly that's what caused it. But if you see something in this area, right under the jawbone, that's exactly where a cell phone sits and people are holding the phone to their head talking for hours a day blasting themselves within some cases a million or two microwatts uh, per square meter which is 
how most RF meters read. That's a ton. That's insane. It's a lot of radiation. So uh, less is more. And I just try to distance myself. If you have a phone a few feet away, even just a few feet away, you've already reduced your exposure by tenfold. So uh, I don't ever hold the phone to my head. I use an air tube headset like I'm using for you. I still use a hardwired uh, keyboard, hardwired mouse, ethernet computer connection, and I can't measure anything. There's no RF in my house. I'm not close to any cell towers. I've got plenty of trees. So we, it's a pretty good spot. Yeah. We have to do the best that we can. We can't live in a bubble. And I heard a good quote the other day saying the fear of EMFs is more harmful than the EMFs will ever be. So. The fear is, the fear is pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it's if, if say it's worse. I guess it depends on the person, but I try not to live in fear too much about it. I just take action steps and go from there. Yeah. And you mentioned before about diet, how you could be eating the best diet in the world, but it's not actually um may not actually be being absorbed. Um you could be feeding overgrowths or it's it may just be a band-aid solution. So what is I know it's a little bit different with every client, but what's your general overview when it comes to diet and gut health? Obviously organic as much as possible because we know that pesticide herbicides kill beneficial bacteria in the gut. Even at a PPB parts per billion level, glyphosate can damage beneficial bacteria. So organic is key. If people can do local so that there's less travel time, therefore the nutrient density is preserved, then we're going to have them do local as well. Like I don't buy any meat at the grocery store anymore. If I do, it's a rare occasion, but we've been able to find some organic pastured farms locally. So we get beef there, we get chicken, we get turkey, we get pork, we get bison, we get whatever we can uh, locally pasture raised organically, uh, fruits and veggies, of course, berries, you want to have all those organic broccoli, things like that. Uh, we stick to mostly paleo template. I play with all different sorts of templates with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, but good meats, good fats, good veggies. Those are kind of the foundation. You know, there's a couple cases where if someone has really, really bad gut issues, we may push them more towards even a carnivore plan. Uh, I recently did a podcast with a guy named Dr. Al who is a, a periodontist and he ended up with a cancer diagnosis and used a carnivore diet to basically reverse his issue. So uh, I believe he had some other therapies on board as well, but he's a huge proponent of it. And so when you hear stories like that, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And I've seen many people with autoimmune gut issues with major gut inflammation. And as long as we gave them enough enzymes and acids and we got them on closer to carnivore, maybe with the addition of some berries and, maybe some vegetables if they could tolerate it. We had incredible success. So I think it depends on the person, but in general, good meats, good fats, good veggies. That's usually the opposite to what most people think is good for gut health. They are, we're so bombarded by information saying that red meat causes colon cancer and inflammatory bowel diseases, but your diet um, recommendations then seemed very focused on high quality animal protein. So could you talk about why meat is actually good for gut health and it's actually one of the most easier to digest foods. Yeah, I've had cases of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, pancolitis, major, major, major gut issues. You know, we're talking like severe where the gastro doctors are throwing their hands up saying, we don't know what to do besides give you this drug or this steroid or this medication. And it's not pretty. And we've been able to reverse many of those cases, you know, we can't legally say cured, but we've had very, very good success with those people using animal products as a foundation of it. And so if you look at vegetarians and vegans, we often find that they don't have enough amino acids that we often find major gut compromise. So leaky gut issues, we find anxiety, depression, a lot more commonly in vegetarian vegan people. If you look at Dr. Weston A. Price, who was a dentist who traveled the world uh, back in the I want to say it was in the 20s through the 40s. It may have been the 1930s, 1940s. And he was a dentist, so he was obviously wanting to study the effects of the ancestral, what he called the ancestral diet or the traditional diet of various cultures around the world and how it affected their dental health. And he would look at these little small towns in the mountains where they were disconnected from mainstream society that was doing sugar and processed foods of the 20th century. And they were just doing traditional foods and he never found cavities. He never found gum disease. He never found any teeth issue at all uh, in these people. And then he would look at people who were, let's say they were vegetarians or people who were doing sugar and more quote processed commerce type foods, the foods that were 
commonly traded breads and whatever, those people had terrible health. They were shorter in stature. They, from a, he took pictures of these people back then as well. They didn't look as good. They had definitely more birth defects, more growth issues. Their teeth were terrible. They had cavities. They had not enough room in their teeth. Their wisdom teeth couldn't come in properly. So they had to get those extracted versus all these traditional diet people, meats and veg vegetables and tubers and roots and such. Those people, their wisdom teeth came in fine. So when we look at all the dental surgeons around the world ripping out wisdom teeth, like they did to me, I had to get all of my wisdom teeth extracted because I didn't have enough room in my mouth. You know, we could attribute that directly to the nutrition of our ancestors and they were eating grains and processed sugars. So I just go based on what he, what he found and I've implemented that clinically and it's, it's done very, very well. Now, are there cases where people are so sick that they can't tolerate meat? Yes. But we often, like I said, give those people supplemental enzymes and acids and bile salts and whatever we need to use to help get those foods in because you're getting so many good B vitamins. You're getting amino acids like carnitine, which is helpful for mitochondrial function and energy. Can't tell you how many chronic fatigue vegetarian vegan people I've seen that their energy levels skyrocket once we get them back on good animal protein. You've got zinc, which is going to be really high in certain meats. Zinc's critical for the immune system. And so a lot of things are just really difficult to get without the animal protein piece. And many people will argue, oh, well, you can do hemp protein or pea protein, but the amino acid profiles, they just don't match up. You know, the bang for your buck, they just don't match up. And so um, I've, I've done some experiments with people and 99.9 .9 out of 100 times, we're able to get people to eat meat and feel good doing it. And of course, it's quality is, is key. So I'm on board with all the ethical reasons, but in terms of, uh, I ask people the question, do you want to survive or do you want to thrive? And of course, everyone says, I want to thrive. And I say, well, okay, well, based on what I've seen clinically, personally, et cetera, you need animal protein to thrive and you can't, you know, you can survive with just plants, but you probably won't thrive at least long-term. Now I'll, the last part of this little rant is, you know, people will go from a standard diet, you know, like fast food and whatever, and they'll go on vegetarian or vegan diet after they see some health documentary and they may feel good for months or even a few years. But, you know, I've only seen maybe two or three people over working with people for 10 years. I've maybe seen maybe two or three people that were long-term vegetarians or vegans, like we're talking 10, 20 years plus. And those are people that were still doing eggs or, you know, coconut oil or you know, avocados. I mean, they, they were trying very, 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 very hard. And even then, when we looked at their labs, we still saw issues there. So they would argue they feel great after 20 years, but when we look on paper, we still see room for improvement. Yeah, I think the listener's probably familiar with my approach and I'm totally on the same page as you, all for the ethical reasons, but I think it is important, especially when you're trying to overcome a health issue. Maybe when you're healthy, you might be able to tolerate it for a short period of time. But um, yeah, I love your approach too. Um, so before we finish up, I wanted you to touch a little bit on stress management. So we know how stress negatively affects the gut, but then having digestive issues and IBS, it can make you more stressed. So what are your favorite tools for reducing that cortisol? Totally. Yeah, I've actually got a formula on, on my desk here that I use, which is helpful, called Emotional Ally. This is a tincture. It's got motherwort, which is one of my favorite herbs for heart issues and uh, anxiety, just stress, overwhelm. Uh, the The subtitle to this formula is called a big herbal hug, which is mm -hmm. funny. Uh, but it's got motherwort, skullcap, passionflower. So I like I like what are called nervines. Nervines can be calming herbs like passionflower, which can be really helpful to kind of reset the nervous system or to put the brakes on the nervous system. So many people, I mean, since the internet came along and since smartphones and social media came along, I feel like the whole world is stuck on sympathetic overdrive. We just never turn off. I mean, people take their phones to their bed and check social media right before they go to bed or they'll check their email or they'll check the news. I mean, it's just ridiculous what we're doing to ourselves. And so I often use herbs, calming herbs like that to downregulate or kind of downshift, if you will, and pull out of that go, go, go mode that we're often trapped in. I've got two young kids, so that contributes to the go, go, go as well. Uh, of course, music is a big one for me. Uh, I'm not a big 
meditation guy where I could just sit down mainly because I just don't have the time. By the time I put the kids to bed, I mean, it's late. You know, by the time I put them to bed, I get the house cleaned up with the wife. We get the dogs taken care of. We get the, the farm cat taken care of. We get the bird feeders in so the raccoons don't get them. I mean, we've, by the time we do all that, you know, it, it, there's not much time. Now, some would argue, oh, come on, you could do five minutes of meditation. And I do, but it's more of like a moving meditation where I'm walking. I've got a pond on my property. So my wife now walk to the pond and we'll feed the fish. We like to watch the fish come in and eat the food. We'll uh, check on the trees. I'll prune off the dead branches. We'll check on the wildflowers. Uh, we'll get some blueberries. We'll check on the bushes, see if they're producing any fruit. So we'll do kind of the more connected to nature meditation. That's more, more where I quote meditate rather than, I don't know, sitting cross-legged and putting on a, a, head, a headset. You know, I don't think you have to have a, a formal meditation like that. I like mine to be pretty informal. Um, Epsom salt baths are, are huge. I really enjoy those. Put a couple drops of lavender essential oil in. Uh, I love float tanks, flotation therapy, which is basically a large bathtub with a thousand pounds of Epsom salt. You float on the surface of the water and it's very relaxing. It's typically in a spa setting. Float tanks, those are amazing. Uh, I would say herbs uh, are my go-to, and I really enjoy riding my bike. I've got a bike with an electric motor on it, so it's fun because I could go super fast and I could go super far. So, you know, I could do 20, 30 miles without breaking a sweat, which is really fun. So I love to just tour the countryside, look for deer, and look for, um, like we've seen a couple of owls, big old great horned owls. We've seen those hanging out in top of the tree. So I'll stop and watch the owl for a minute and see what he's doing and look for hawks. And uh, so we have fun, you know, we try to just have fun with it. And of course, being present with your kids is, is good too. For parents out there listening, you know, parents are often distracted with all their obligations of work and such, but you know, some of the most relaxing and fun times I have is when I just sit down with the kids and we just read a book and we just don't focus on anything else. We don't talk about or think about the world's problems or our problems. We just, we just sit and we just interact with the kids and kind of live in their little world for a while. And, and that's really, really relaxing. Well, I think you've just answered a few of my final questions. I always ask my guests a little bit about how they still stay healthy. So I was going to ask what's one herb, nutrient or supplement that you couldn't live without? Would it be an adaptogenic herb or motherwort? Oof, probably so. Probably so. Uh, I really love motherwort. I could say it's done a lot for me. I really enjoy holy basil as well. Mm. It's one of my favorites. Ashwagandha has done a lot of good for me, but I don't like it long term. Uh, and passion flower has been great. So I think those are some of my favorites. But yeah, I mean, really, it's just a combination of uh, believing in yourself. It's a combination of loving yourself. It's a combination of being on your team and you know supporting yourself, not putting yourself down, getting rid of the negative self-talk, getting rid of negative people, bringing in more positive people, embracing the positive people in your life. Those things go a long way. Yeah, getting rid of those energy vampires if you want to ultimately heal. Is there a book that you'd recommend? So on the subject of gut health um, that I can recommend to the listeners? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nathan did a good job. I had him on my podcast a while back, Neil Nathan. He did a book called Toxic, all about mold and Lyme and co-infections. He doesn't go too much into necessarily nutrition in that. He does talk about low histamine diet and such, but just in regards to how gut and mold are linked and how mycotoxins can affect the gut and the immune system, I think it's a great book. It gets a little geeky, but uh, I think it's a wonderful read. Love that one too. And finally, Evan, where can people find more from you online? So website, podcast, social media, everything will be linked in the show notes. Sure. My hub is just Evan Brand, E-V-A-N, last name Brand, B-R-A-N-D dot com. I've got the podcast there. I've been putting out a new episode every year for, I think we're coming up on nine, eight, wow. nine years, something like that. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes, just like what we talked about today. You know, very, very similar. You did a great job as an interviewer. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Really great questions. And uh, if people want to hear more, they can check it out on the show. And clinically, I work with people around the world. So they could book a call at my site and would be happy to help. Great. Again, your podcast is amazing. You can just go deep and spend like a whole month listening to all of those episodes. And it's a gold mine of information. And it's one of the only podcasts that I listen to. So thank you so much for you being a great resource. I've learned a lot. And as I said, I think we kind of have a similar journey. And yeah, wish you all the best of luck for your future. You too. And uh, thanks for the feedback.